Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what's in the components of your nutrient management plan. Um, I would recommend, whether you get a permit or not, to get a nutrient management plan. Getting the permit allows you some things that won't happen to you if you have a spill. But if you have a nutrient management plan, it helps you with your day-to-day -day operation. And if you keep the records from the nutrient management plan, then if you do have something go wrong, you have a record to tell Don Hall or the people from DEQ what it was you were doing. And even though you may think you don't want to, will never have a spill, you still have a record if you have an NMP and keep those records. If you're going to go to that much effort, you might want to get the NMP if you go through the risk assessment that Mark talked about and actually think you need an NMP or a, a permit. But I think everybody who has manure and has to deal with it ought to have some kind of a nutrient management plan. They don't have to be complex. If your plan is to pile your manure and give it to your neighbors, <coughs> write it down. Put it in a file. Keep it there so that you know, and then keep records of when the neighbors come and get the manure. And you also ought to have the manure tested so that they know what they're getting so that they can tell how much to apply on their fields. So there's just a few things that you need to have that are, that are important in a nutrient management plan that way. But in the regular nutrient management plan, we're going to talk now about uh, all the things that go into one of those. So we'll get, we have um, the required elements for the apples and calves to obtain a permit by rule. These requirements are in state rule and state technical standards. When you talk about technical standards, the technical standards are those from NRCS. NMPs for a permit or permit by rule must be approved by a certified planner. The following then is a summary of those required content. You need to ensure that you have adequate storage. You need to ensure that you have proper management of mortalities. You need to ensure that run-on is diverted from waste storage facilities and clean water is separated from waste, the waste stream. You need to prevent direct animal contact with surface waters. You need to ensure proper handling of chemicals such as fertilizers, pesticides, medications, etc. We need to identify conservation practices such as buffers and runoff controls and other practices on the fields that will keep your manure on the fields. You need to establish practices and protocols for land applications to ensure appropriate nutrient utilization. You need to know how to test your manure and the wastewater and the soils. We need to identify records that will be maintained to document the implementation and management of the NMP, and we need to make sure that you're in compliance with the state standards. This includes all the NRCS conservation practices that are applicable to each facility's circumstances. Okay, we'll go through these. We'd, we'd like to be able to assess your operation or help you assess your operation. We'll go walk around the facility. I'm going to go talk to a fellow over in Box Elder County tomorrow, and he says, when you come, make sure you bring your boots, because we've got some some manure walking to do. So we'll do that. The thing I would suggest to you is when Mark or I or Nathan Daugs or one of the folks that come out to talk to you, when we come out, don't hide something from us. We're not there to uh, regulate you. We're not there to turn you in. We're there to help you. And I have been out to places where uh, after the first or second visit, the, we finally find out that there's a break in the concrete structure that's supposed to contain the manure and it's getting away from the fellow. Well, if, I, if you know that up front, it makes it a lot easier for me to, to help solve the problem than if I go out there and you say, well, I know that there's this place back here, but I won't show that to him because maybe I'll get away with it. Uh, you might, and that's okay, but if you show me, then we can help you solve the problem. You know your place is better than anybody. You've been around it and fixed things. You've been around it and worked on them. So when, you, when somebody comes out to, to review your place, don't hide stuff from us because it doesn't do you any good in the long run to do that. Let's get the place fixed so that it'll work. We need to determine the livestock numbers and the manure production quantities. We need to test the soil and the manure. We need to determine manure application rates based on nitrogen or phosphorus, and that comes from, from these two items. If we test the soil and test the manure, then we can tell how much of that manure you can put on the soils. We identify options for handling livestock mortalities. Consider alternative management options to deal with excess nutrients or manure. If you don't have enough land to land apply your manure, you have to figure out some other way to get rid of it. And that has, that's becoming a problem as, as people are moving out into the farmland and taking up 
uh, acreage that you used to rent or lease to apply manure to, uh, that's becoming more of a premium. So you may have to figure out a different way, either composting or something to get rid of that excess manure. So there are other uses of manure. We can do cropping system modifications. Some crops take up more manure than others. So you need to look at those options. We will talk a little bit, Rhonda will talk a little bit about feed management to reduce the amount of phosphorus in the, in the manure. And we need to know how we can apply the manure. And this, this is our big issue now with, in terms of um, not being able to apply on snow-covered or frozen soils. Uh, we say snow-covered and frozen soils, but in the language it says on dormant uh, crops as well. So the dormant crop limitation may be more important to us than not being able to apply on, on uh, snow and frozen soils. <coughs> and that's a good question because, you know, frankly, I don't know. If, you're, if, if you've, got a, uh, you've got your manure bunkers full at the beginning of the spring and you take a, a two-week period to get that manure out on the ground and put all that water out there, you've delayed your planting experience by a couple of three weeks. And you're not, now you don't have enough season to grow a crop. So it's a good question. I don't know when you're going to do it. So it's really important that we get this stopped, even if it takes a lawsuit from the UACD or somebody to, uh, to stop this from happening. And that, and that may well be. I am too. And I, don't, and, I, and I wished I had an answer. And I don't know what the final will be. I, I think you reflect the attitude of a lot of people. And us included. Uh, you know, it, it irritates me that we, we have to deal with this kind of an issue. We fought this issue. When I worked for NRCS 10 years ago, we fought this issue and got it resolved. We could, because we had fields out here that were flat and we could berm the edges of them, we weren't going to risk, with our Umari that Niels went through this morning, we're not going to risk anything getting away from the fields. And now they're saying, well, because that doesn't fit the national mold, we're not going to allow you to do that. And I think it's important that we fight this issue now, and you got until tomorrow. You got until tomorrow to get, an, uh, to get an, your voice heard. Sleep. It is. And unless we can get the Congress to do something about it, we're going to be in a lot of Don't trouble. I've seen some other things where the, the, uh, there's some congressional committees that are looking at reducing all of the potential impact of regulations on farming and, and, and other uh, businesses. Yes, back here. It's not the state that's doing that. It's the... It's EPA, I yeah. The, I, I'll, I'll grant you, I used to work for NRCS, and I've been in their Washington offices, and I've seen what happens to those bureaucrats when they get a call from their senator, from the senator from Utah or the senator from Nevada or Nebraska or wherever. They go nuts trying to figure out how they're going to solve the problem that that senator brought to them. I'm telling you that what they want and what your senators want is each of you to write them a letter telling them what it does to you for this to happen to you. If, they, if we get enough of those letters, something will happen. And I think that individual letters, I, you've had UACD has written letters. Is it better to call them or write them? I think it's better to write them because then they have a, they have a document that, that's there. But you can call them, too. I don't think there's any reason why you can't call their staff. Say, look, this is going to happen to me. What do I need to do for you to have documentation so that you know that this is, this is a problem that we can't deal with? I don't think anybody in the room, regardless of who you represent, would be against you doing that to solve this problem for Utah. Tomorrow you better email, yeah. So I think a call would help, no question. Okay, the other thing you need to be concerned about is, is when you apply the manure to make sure that the manure stays on the field. And then we need to calibrate our application equipment. When you're, put, when you're applying manure, if you can see the manure out there, you've got 10 to 15 tons of manure on an acre. And so you need to calibrate your equipment so you know how much you're put, actually putting on. Okay, when we come out to assess, we want to, we want to impress that, that the idea is to keep the clean water clean. You want to keep that water that falls out of the sky from getting into the manure if you can. So if you have shed, covered sheds and, and other um, structures around, make sure that the water that hits on the top of those sheds gets away from your, your manure pile. It doesn't go into it. We need to, to look at the, you need to make sure that you're looking at your dikes and those things that you're using to contain water to make sure that they're still functioning. You need to pay attention to loading and distribution. And I have stories I could tell about this, but it's lunchtime.
Use care in manure and water handling practices to min minimize contact with manure and reduce water use. Ask one of us to come out and walk the field with you. Not that we know any more about that stuff than you do, but we've seen other places. And, and through that, we've gained a lot of experience looking at, looking at those things and looking for things. Okay, just a, a table that shows you how much um, manure you produce. A milking cow produces 1.3 cubic feet of manure. If a cubic, a cubic foot weighs about 75 to 80 pounds, so if you've got a cow that's producing 75 pounds of milk, she's producing 80 pounds of manure. So the way to get this problem solved is to send a gallon of milk, a manure home with every gallon of milk that's sold. You got, and pay the same price for it. <laughs> yeah, and pay the same price for it. <laughs> Your soil test, we can go back to this one. This is just a way to determine how much manure you're going to produce. So you take the table that I had before and use this table to figure out. But that's pretty much straightforward ma mathematics. Your soil test should be done, done annually on annual crop fields. And on alfalfa fields, they should be tested every three years. And keep those records. Because when you're applying your manure and other fertilizer, you want to make sure that you're watching what's happening to the, the phosphate content. Because IFA will come out and they'll say, oh, you need more phosphorus. And you've got your record that says, oh, no, I don't need more phosphorus. I'm already getting more phosphorus from my, nor my manure than what I need. And so you need to have those records to help save you money from salesmen and other reasons. Um, you should do your manure tests annually um, and for manure sampled at the time of application. You want to do it when you're going to apply it. Not You don't do that in the fall and then apply in the spring because the manure constituency changes over the winter time. You want to make sure you sample your liquid and solid separately because you're going to get nitrogen in the liquid and a lot of phosphorus in the solid. And then you determine your nitrogen rates based upon the soil tests and the, and the manure tests that you've done. What do we do with livestock mortalities? You can bury them on site, compost them, get a local landfill, send them down to Coonies. If you're lucky and live out next to the range, you haul them out and let the scavengers have them. They'll do it in about 10 days. Manure tests take normally eight to 10 days. Is that right? Where's my extension man back there? About eight to 10 days. and, and um, Sometimes they'll get back and it'll take two weeks, but I've, normally you can get those back in eight to ten days. So you do it, you do it two weeks before you want, you want to spread your manure and then and get it done that way if you want to know it today, what you're putting out there. Okay, we've talked about this stuff. I don't know if there's anything new in that. You need to determine how and when to apply the manure, and this winter applications thing affects your storage considerations. Um, I was on a dairy in, in Puerto Rico they have no downtime, so when do they spread their manure? They actually had a, a gun, and they were spreading the, li the liquid manure out of the gun onto their fields, and they're growing grass for, for their uh, forage, and they simply dump it on there while the grass is growing. So you, it makes it really green, and then the water rain comes along and washes off, and it's not quite as green. But it depends a lot on the consistency of your manure and, and some considerations for neighbors. We, we mention that off and on because as the world becomes more urbanized, if we're going to live in that part of the world, we need to make sure that we're being as good a neighbor as we can and change anything that you're doing. Yeah. And, the, and my favorite story is a, a man lives over here. I won't say where he lives. But uh, his neighbor came to him and said, I can't stand the smell. You, you keep bringing your manure to this field by my house. And the, and the farmer told him, he says, you wanted to move out here to have country air. Well, that's what country air smells like. If you don't like it, move back to the city. And he keeps spreading the manure on the field. So the, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can, you can create the order if you want it. But if you want to make friends with the neighbor, you don't do that next to his field on Friday night and then don't cover it up until Monday morning. Whoever sure. There, well, you remember You remember what Mark's comment was with the, with the sign, and I think that's appropriate. Okay, one, we need to make sure we got the 25-year, 24-hour storm event, and we need to calculate then the storage requirements with sufficient capacity to hold that. One of the problems we've had in the past is we've only, we've only uh, sized these structures for 90 days with the no snow um, <coughs> application restriction. We're going to need more than that. So we may have to go to 180-day storage in order to get enough storage. So many of you may have to come back.
And so what we do is we estimate the amount that you need for that 25-year storm event and include the amount that your animals are going to produce for 180 days, and that's how big we build it. And then if a storm comes that's bigger than that, you got your permit, it's not a problem. And so that's the thing that we need to have heard on this issue that's coming up now. That's a political issue. Now, I don't know how you, do, I don't know how you solve that. I wish I did. Ha, ha, ha.